morning. Good morning. I'm going to give the next talk on the Fukan Zazengi. The Fukan Zazengi um, is a text uh, that Dogen Zenji, the founder of our school, who lived uh, in the 13th century in Japan, uh, wrote right after he came back from China. And we're pretty far into it. I think this is lecture nine of the series. So today, uh, here's what I'm going to talk about. Oh, this is also something for those of you who haven't been here during the week that we chant every Thursday morning and chanted, uh, I would say just about every Zen center, Soto Zen center that I've been to. And in Japan, it's chanted at, well, usually at night after uh, Zazen is when I've encountered that being chanted in Japan. Okay, so in this section, Dogen said, wrote, Although it is said that there are many minds as there are persons, still they all negotiate the way solely in Zazen. Why leave behind the seat that exists in your home and go aimlessly off to dusty realms of other lands? If you make one misstep, you go astray from the way directly before you. Although, okay, that's that part. Sorry, I have it kind of run together in my notes. Okay, so the first part of this is, um, Although it is said that there are many minds as there are persons, still they all negotiate the way solely in Zazen. So when I looked at the literal translation of this, looked at the characters for this, it turns out that um, there is no uh, place where it says uh, many minds as there are persons. That's not actually part of the original uh, part of this uh, paragraph. So this paragraph is... It just for the geeks here in the crowd, this paragraph is probably, uh, this translation is probably from Waddell and Abbey's that was published in the Eastern Buddhist. And I think um, that that's, they're the only ones who translate this way. So, you know, I think a literal translation of this would be uh, something like, it is said, all oh, there are infant varieties of teachings, uh, 84,000 teachings. You or one should negotiate the way by only practicing zazen. So that would be more what Dogen actually said. And so in Japanese, often the pronoun is implied. It's not actually in the translation itself, in the actual word. So maybe Wadel and Abi thought, okay, I'm going to, this is about persons, therefore I'm going to call it minds. Anyway, I think it's really. Personally, I think it's really misleading when I read that. So anyway, it is said, although there are infinite varieties of teachings, and then what the literal translation is 84,000 teachings, one should negotiate the way only by only practicing Zazen. So um, G.U. Kenneth, who is a really a well-known 20th century teacher in the United States, she started Shasta Abbey, she translates this pretty simply as the means of training are various, but do pure zazen. Mm -hmm. So Dogen's saying there, are, as she did, there are a lot of different ways to practice Buddhism. There are lots of different ways to engage in spiritual practice or religion or however we want to talk about this effort that we make to improve our lives and that of others in an efficacious way. Um, but just to talk about, about Buddhism here. Um, so he's saying there are a lot of different paths, there are a lot of different ways to practice, and there are lots of different ways to meditate in Buddhism as well. And in the United States, uh, actually much like as it was in China, uh, when Buddhism first came to China, we are inundated with all of these different texts from different teachers who are quite famous, and they are all from different schools. So for example, Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese Zen teacher, and Pema Chodron uh, is uh, a student of Chogyam Trungpa, Kyogyam, Kyogyam Trungpa, Trungpa, who was in the Tibetan lineages of Kagyu and Nyingma. 
So she is a Tibetan practitioner. And Jack Kornfield, who was one of the founders of Apossum in the United States, he was uh, he was a monk in Burma and Thailand and a Theravadan Buddhist. So these are really different schools and they have very different ways of practicing meditation, different instruction of practicing meditation from what we do uh, here in Soto Zen. And I think um, most of the things that we read, so this is just an aside on my part, most of the things that we read, like Thich Nhat Hanh and Pema Children and Jack Hornfield and all the kind of popular teachers, um, most of what we're reading that they're writing is kind of generalized take on Buddhist practice. So Pema Chodron mostly, she's not getting into the weeds of talking about Tibetan Buddhism. She's talking about, you know, the places that scare you, how to work with impermanence, things like that. And Tibetan Buddhism is very much, that side of it is very much about skillful means, cultivating practices to help to follow the Bodhisattva path. Um, so anyway, I think it's a, most of us don't realize that these, this is not, these teachings are not just kind of blanket Buddhism. Um, so I think, you know, this, uh, Dogen's pointing to this, he's saying, you know, there are lots of different ways to meditate. There were a lot of different ways to meditate when Dogen was around. And he's saying, uh, that despite the fact that there are all these different ways, he's saying, you know, please practice Zazen. He believes that Zazen is uh, the most important thing. So he says, uh, although there are 84,000 teachings, you should negotiate the way by only practicing Zazen. So he's giving you this very uh, pos positive in the sense that he's positive, that this practice is, is good for everybody. And I'm gonna say something a little more about that later. And then, then Dogen says, why leave behind the seat that exists in your home and go aimlessly off to the dusty realms of other lands? So, you know, I think if we read this line on, on its surface, we might think something like, why go around to other uh, places uh, and why not just stay at home? But actually, he's making a reference to a parable in the Lotus Sutra. And the Lotus Sutra was... Uh, one of the sutras that was produced in India right around the turn of the millennium. And um, it's very, very influential in Japanese schools of Buddhism and in Chinese schools like Huayan. Well, actually, excuse me, that's not true. Huayan is the Avatam Saka Sutra. Anyway, uh, Tiantai Buddhism in China uh, uh, was focused on the Lotus Sutra. So this is a story that he's referring to in the Lotus Sutra. And this is in chapter four of the Lotus Sutra. And it's uh, usually the, the chapters titled uh, Belief and Understanding are Perhaps Faith. And this is often, sometimes it's called the prodigal son, but actually that's a misnomer because that's referencing a Christian story, which is different than this story. Uh, this story, I would say, is more like the story of the destitute son. So, okay, so in the story itself, <laughs> Uh, there's a father and a son, and the son, when he's a young man, leaves home, and he becomes uh, essentially a beggar. He's wandering from place to place. He's destitute. Uh, he, you know, never kind of finds anything that works for him, and he just sort of slides into this downward spiral. Now, his father never stops looking for him. His father always has this his son in mind all the time. Uh, but he can't find him. So meanwhile, the father just goes on with his life and he actually becomes quite a wealthy person and uh, has a mass of large land holdings, etc. And so um, the son, as he's wandering around, as I mentioned, every time he, he just becomes more and more impoverished uh, mentally and physically. And uh, one day, He's wandering, he's been wandering around and he comes to the edge of a large crowd of people surrounding this man who's up on the dais, who's very rich and people are waiting on him and everything. And uh, the rich man sees him and realizes of course that that's his son. But the son doesn't recognize this guy as his uh, father. 
So the son thinks to himself, as he's standing on the edge of the crowd, he thinks to himself, and this is from the actual sutra, he thinks a translation, this must be a king or someone of royal rank. It's no place for me to obtain any work. It would be better to go to poor some poor hamlet where there is a place to hire out my labor and food and clothing are easier to get. If I tarry here long, I may suffer oppression and forced labor. So he's afraid that, you know, they're going to come and grab him and make him become essentially a serf or a slave for this rich man. So this guy must have really been put through the ringer during his life to have that be, you know, his first thought in this situation. So the father, having seen him and realizing who he is, wants to help him. He wants to connect with him. So he sends out a couple of his retainers to go and uh, offer to hire this, this son, his son. Um, but what happens is when the son sees these well-dressed retainers coming for him, he runs off. He's scared to death of these guys that they're going to grab him. And, uh, and so he tries to take off. So at that point, the father realizes that what he's done is not particularly skillful. So he thinks, okay, well, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to send a different two guys to talk to him. And this time, and this is in the, I love this description. It's in the sutra. He sends one-eyed, squat, common, and unimposing guys. So they go and they talk to his son and they say, look, we'll hire you and uh, pay you to shovel dung. In other words, to shovel shit, you know, at, for the, for us, maybe they had a lot of outhouses back in that day in, in India, I'm not sure, but anyway, that's what he does. And so he agrees to do that. And over time, he becomes more and more, and he, you know, goes up through the ranks and becomes more and more important. And he ends up being the manager of all of his father's estate, but he still doesn't know that this is his father. And the father, uh, meanwhile, you know, it's very close to him because they have this close, he says, you know, you are like a son to me. So when the father comes near the end of his life, what happens is that he tells everybody, he says, this person is actually my son. He doesn't have a name in this story. So, but this person is actually my son. And so, um, you know, he's my main inheritor. He's going to get everything. And I want him to take over after I die. Okay, so what Dogen's talking, the reason Dogen's referring to this teaching is because this teaching is about uh, the, the prequel to the story in the Lotus Sutra is that three of Shakyamuni Buddha's main Theravadan Buddhist Arhat disciples. So Arhat's are there different paths in Buddhism? There's the Pacheka Buddha path, the Arhat path, the Bodhisattva path, and the Buddha path. The Pacheka Buddha is somebody who becomes enlightened uh, without any instruction at all. They just sort of come that way. I would say maybe some in our contemporary society, somebody like Eckhart Tolle might be a Pacheka Buddha. Then Arhats are people who believe that they cannot become in early in this Buddhist teaching, and, and this is Theravadan Buddhism, that they cannot become Buddhas or Bodhisattvas because the path requires that you receive a prediction from a Buddha in person in order to follow this path. So they don't they figure my goal is to get off the wheel of birth and death. So that's basically the end game of the Arhat path. That's what uh, in early Buddhism, teachings, that's who Mahakashapa was, it's who Ananda was, uh, all of these big disciples are all arhats. And then one of the main things about the Lotus Sutra is the Lotus Sutra says, you know something, you don't have to receive a prediction from the Buddha in person, from a Buddha in person, in order to follow the Bodhisattva path. This is a universal thing, everybody can become a Bodhisattva. And in the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni Buddha prophesizes that everybody will become a Buddha. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on in the Lotus Sutra. As this doctrine goes on through time, hundreds of years, we end up with something like Soto Zen, where we say all beings are Buddha. All beings are the nature of Buddha. 
So it's kind of progresses from that. Soto Zen, the, the, the uh, Lotus Sutra is very important in Soto Zen. Okay, but this story in the, in, in the Lotus Sutra is where three of Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples, major disciples come to him and say, we thought we couldn't become bodhisattvas. So we've been following the Arhat path. We didn't have any faith that we could become uh, bodhisattvas. So we just didn't follow that path. And now you've shown us that we can do this, that, that we've received prediction and we can become Buddhists through the Bodhisattva path. And so we want to tell you this story about how we wandered destitute, you know. So that in some ways, is the word sectarian? This is very um, biased against Theravada Buddhism because this is a Mayana Sutra. So it's telling us all the reasons why the Theravada Buddhists are wrong. So basically, these, these guys are coming in saying, we were wrong, we didn't understand. Now we understand that um, we, we haven't wasted our time wandering around, but, but now we understand that, that we can have faith in this teaching that we're going to be bodhisattvas. And then they tell him the story. They are the destitute sons. Shakyamuni Buddha is the father. And uh, Shakyamuni Buddha is practicing skillful means in order to you know, get them in so that they can develop this faith and understanding over time. So when Dogen says, uh, why leave behind the seeds that exist in your home and go aimlessly off to dusty realms and other lands, that is what he's referring to is this story. And um, that seems to be the general consensus among all the scholars and translators. So I'm gonna go with that, that that is actually what Dogen's referring to here. So I think, you know, for us, it is, uh, it is uh, I think we all wander around uh, from one thing to the other. I know I did when I started practicing. I started practicing with um, reading Be Here Now. And I read Alan Watts and uh, this kind of dates me, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I read Alan Watts and all this stuff. And then eventually, I, I studied, I went to some Tibetan Buddhist places. I have to tell you, they were way too nice for me. So it's like, <laughs> it was kind of like, Ooh, this is scary. All these people want to relate to me. So <laughs> so I went to Zen Buddhism and nobody wanted to relate to me. I just, you know, it was like, okay, <laughs> just come in here. It's scary as hell. <laughs> and um, seemed like uh, somehow it resonated for me. So, <laughs> so I stayed and now I'm, you know, I, I'm a great believer in Soto Zen. Uh, but, you know, however you come across what feels comfortable to you, and thank goodness there are 84,000 teachings, right? Because it would, it would be crazy if all of us were all trying to do the same thing. It's a good thing there are 84,000 teachers as well, because otherwise it, it just couldn't happen. So anyway, um, so I think that that we do go aimlessly off. And from a Soto Zen point of view, from a, just a Zen Chan point of view, this story is about your, the Buddha is actually a stand-in for Buddha nature, that we are all Buddha nature. So we think that we're not Buddha nature. We think that we do not have this inherent altruistic nature to want to, to be able to have the ability, if you will, to do good in the world to do good in our lives with other people and for ourselves. And so I think it takes a while for us to understand and have faith that that's possible. And so we do kind of wander around. And from a Western psychological point of view, we wander around in our neuroses, right? We wander around in our suffering. We wandering around in our, our lack of uh, uh, maybe self-confidence, we wander around in a lot of different ways. So this story is about coming back and discovering that we that our deepest nature is calling to us and that we can have faith in that aspect of ourselves as Buddhists, that we are already Buddhists, which is what our school teaches. We are already Buddhists. We have Buddha nature, as does everything else. We have Buddha nature, and it's a matter of connecting with that but and letting that flower and of course that's the practice and that's the hard part um so that's what he's saying here 
when he says, you know, so don't leave behind this seat, this Buddha nature that you are already that exists in your home, that exists as you are right here, this person, and wander around uh, the dusty realms, which is usually considered to be uh, unwholesome, perhaps, or confused, delusional states, wander around in these realms of these other lands. So you can, if you come back to your true nature, you will see this. So that's basically what Dogen's saying here. Uh, he's not saying, uh, uh, don't go somewhere else. You know what I mean? It's, because that was what I thought when I first read it. And I thought, well, Dogen went to China. Why Why wouldn't you, you know, why would you not go somewhere? So that's not what he's talking about. Okay, so um, then he says, uh, if you make one misstep, you go astray from the way directly before you. So, you know, this, this sounds really dire, right? If you, if you make one misstep, you go astray from the way directly before you and maybe you won't be able to find your way back. So um, do you ever go hiking? And uh, one of the admonitions of when you're hiking out in the woods or something is to always turn around and look behind you because when you're going back, that's what you're gonna see. And it's really good advice because when you go out, you're looking a certain way and it really does look different when you go back and you're like going, gosh, have I been here before? So there, to me, it's kind of like, I feel like Dogen's saying something kind of scary and very dogmatic about this. So I was thinking about this and I thought, well, you know, what is going on in Dogen's life? Because the other thing is about this is that, okay, so um, the Fukan Zazengi is a rewrite of a 12th century Chinese meditation text and uh, called the Sao Chan Yi. So excuse me for my pronunciation which means principles of seated meditation. So it has almost the same title as Fukan Zazengi. And it's found, found in a larger monastic code called the Chan Yuan Ching Kui, which means Chan Yuan Pure Regulations for Chan Monastics, what was written in 1103. So this text was, we, they know, we scholars know that Dogen, because he refers to it, was, a, was aware of this text. So, if you look at a side-by-side -side comparison, the two, you can see where Dogen left the original text and where he departed from the original text. This part is not in the original text. So this idea of, you know, if you make one misstep, you go astray, is something that, that Dogen added to this as kind of dogmatic, um, I think kind of scare tactics about why you should sit Zaza. So, you know, I was thinking about, well, why, you know, why would Dogen do that? And uh, I thought, well, you know, if you look at Japanese history, Japanese religious history, and you look at, you look at what Dogen was up against, when he came back from China, he was introducing a new school of Buddhism, right? What we call Soto Zen. And uh, he was up against some pretty formidable um, religious opposition, if you will. Uh, so, you know, Buddhism was introduced to Japan in the mid sixth century. So Dogen was alive in the 13th century. So Buddhism had been around for quite a long time in Japan. In the seventh and eighth century, there were six schools uh, happening. There was the Hoso school, which is Yogacara Buddhism, the Kagon school, which is Huayen, the Tendai school, which was associated with Tiantai from China and their main sutra was the Lotus Sutra. Dogen, by the way, was a Tendai monk before he, well, he got, he was a Tendai monk, then he got Dharma transmission in the Rinzai tradition, and then he went to China and received it in the Soto Zen tradition, which is what he brought back. Anyway, um, there was Rinzai and, in, and uh, all of these were happening. And then in the 12th century, uh, oh, in the 12th century, Rinzai was brought into Japan. And then Dogen in the 13th century, he was trying to promote in the midst of these major schools, particularly Tendai Buddhism, which was huge in Japan. And also Buddhism was associated with governments and with the elite. 
So there was a lot of stuff going on around jockeying for money and position and 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 all this kind of stuff. So, you know, really Dogen had kind of an uphill battle, I think, to be able to establish this new version of Zen in Japan in the midst of these other major Buddhist schools that were pre-existing him. So perhaps that's why he's so strident about this is because he's really trying to get people to come in and become and study so does him. So um, so in the next section of this, this I'm sorry, this lecture is a little bit geeky, but I wanted you to, you know, get kind of what was going on here that he would add this part in and to kind of understand the foundational part of this. I'm I have been uh, in doing these lectures, I've been astounded by the referencing that happens in the Fukan Zazengi to other things. Because when we read it, right, we're just reading it through. And it's a it's a kind of a it's a manual about how to sit Sazen. And so that's what we're doing on Thursday. So I found this kind of interesting, but um, anyway, probably shouldn't apologize for this, but this uh, lecture in particular, I wanted you to understand the background of this. So in the next section, he talks about why it's important to practice. So that's what we'll talk about next time. Thank you. Okay.